Hello friends and welcome back to the Hall of Craft! I'm back with another video for you guys after a rather large unintentional break. And I just wanted to say to all you crafters who stuck with me through it, thank you. And to all of the new people who found me in the meantime, welcome! So I just want to address a couple things real quick before we jump into the video. I'll try not to ramble on too long, but I'll put a link in the description if you just want to skip past this because you don't care. First thing would be, I got a few comments asking why I don't post more frequently. And the answer to that's pretty simple. It's because YouTube is more of a hobby for me than a career. At this point in time, I make these videos in my free time because I have a job that occupies a significant amount of my time in my day to day. So all of these videos are kind of created in my evenings and weekends. And I enjoy that. I get a lot of juice out of making the videos and interacting with you guys. And especially when I read comments from you saying that you got something valuable out of it. That really makes me feel feel awesome when I read those and I think it's really what inspires me to keep going on this channel. What doesn't inspire me to keep going is setting really hard fast deadlines for myself and making this feel like a job. Nothing makes it feel more like work than setting a deadline and putting kind of a time constraint on making this content. So I try to avoid that. Uh, I. With that said, I do really want to get videos up more often than not. I, I don't like taking long breaks. but. I think it's a little unreasonable for me to set uh, kind of like a bi-weekly deadline and try and meet that every time. I think bi-weekly would be ideal. I really enjoy, or I, I, I like the idea of being able to put up videos that often, uh, but I think in reality I can not usually hit it while still maintaining the standards of quality that I want to maintain. Uh, I do not want to become one of those creators who's boxed into making a video every week and then I think as a, as a consumer of that content you can really tell when they feel a little drained and a little stretched and maybe they put out a few videos in a row that are kind of not that inspiring. And I don't want to get to that place. I want all of my videos to be something that I can put out and be proud of. And the second thing would be that I think the pandemic may have burned me out a little bit. And maybe not quite for the reasons you might expect. Uh, I found a lot of the inspiration for my videos came from the fact that I was DMing my own homebrew campaign. And for that campaign I would need terrain pieces because we were playing in person. And a lot of the videos that I made were directly because of pieces that I was making for a session or an upcoming session of my campaign. And I haven't played an in-person session of D&D since February. So I think that may have kind of dried up a little bit of my inspiration for new ideas. And now I'm kind of uh, adjusting to the new world order and starting to kind of get my flow back. And that's really it. I just wanted to be really transparent with you crafters who have been enjoying my content and I just wanted you to know exactly where my head's at because I'm not going anywhere, I don't plan on giving up on this. If you see me take kind of a sizable break, it's not for any kind of real detrimental reason or anything. I just maybe didn't have any ideas that I felt were worth putting out there and I, I'm not going to try and just appease the algorithm because I'm not doing this channel for money. I'm not doing this to try and, you know, make this a career or a business, so I don't, I don't feel the need to try and kind of appease the algorithm by meeting like a weekly timeline. I'm not doing this for growth. If that comes, great. I'm happy to keep making videos and I'm happy for more people to watch them, but that's not the intended purpose of this channel. So, um, thanks for watching, I guess, and don't worry about me. Now that's all out of the way, let's jump right into the video. So I have had these Wrath of Kings models sitting on my shelf for over a year now. I don't think anybody plays this game because when I bought them I got them for like 60% off or like 75% off or something ridiculous on the miniature market and I, I mostly bought them because I thought they looked pretty cool. I have no intentions of playing that game either uh, but they're you know like a pack of armed and armored vicious looking werewolves so like that sounded pretty cool. <laughs> I thought maybe in my head at the time they could make like good knolls, but upon receiving them in person I realized that they're they're rather large 
and uh, much too big to be gnolls. So I was started thinking about like what I could use them for, and I'm thinking like maybe like some kind of tribe of like werewolves that live out in the forest, and they've kind of a little bit more sophisticated and less savage, and they're kind of hidden away from the world. And thinking about it in that lens kind of got me really inspired to paint them up. So here is the boxes, the two boxes that I got. I got a box of Gotha Knights and a box of uh, Scorza Skirmishers. And they are both of House Goretzi uh, of this Wrath of Kings game. So they look pretty awesome. Uh, this Skirmishers box, they're a little less armored and more kind of like scout infantry looking dudes. And then uh, for the Knights box, they are like very heavily armored and they look pretty badass. And it comes with a couple of these leaders who I'm really excited to paint. I think they look awesome. One thing though is I did throw away the female werewolves from the skirmishers box. Uh, they look kind of absurd if you ask me. They have giant anime boobs and I feel like werewolves should be a little bit more gender neutral. In my mind I'm thinking any of the werewolves could transform back into like a male or female humanoid form. I don't think that the werewolf form itself needs to necessarily represent what gender it is and I thought the female ones looked ridiculous so I got rid of those and I'm not painting them. That leaves me with 14 models left in total so I think more than enough for any kind of D&D session. I think 14 models on the table is quite a bit. Like I said before, I really didn't give myself a deadline for this project. I don't have an upcoming session I need them for. Nobody's coming over to my house anytime soon. So I could kind of take my time with these. And take my time, I really did. So I had two major goals that I wanted to kind of accomplish with working on these wolves as kind of a project. The first one is non-metallic metal, and that one should be pretty obvious. They're covered in metal pieces, they have large metal weapons, and non-metallic metallic metal as a technique in general, I think is kind of one of those areas as a mini painter that you could never have enough practice no matter how much you do it. It's a very advanced technique and it is pretty challenging. So because there's 14 models and they have a lot of significant metal chunks on them, I wanted to kind of use this as an opportunity to really practice that technique because I haven't really dove into it too much before. And the second thing is uh, fur texture. So I haven't experimented too much with painting fur texture, but I think these models would be a good benefactor of that technique because they have a few areas where there is sculpted hair like on their tail or the hair coming out of the back of their head um, and that'll be really easy and straightforward to paint but the rest of them any of the areas where it's kind of more like humanoid figure like the musculature of their chests and arms and and like thighs all of that is very smooth so I think that it would be very beneficial to kind of paint a fur texture onto it to give it a little more interest and not just paint it like a flat gray. And I just wanted to give a bit of a disclaimer here. Uh, I don't want you to watch this video and think that I'm trying to pass it off like I'm some, some kind of professional painter and this is a non-metallic metal or fur texture tutorial. That's not what this video is and I am not a professional painter. I think of myself more as kind of like an amateur painter who tries really hard to get better. And I think that that's what I'm trying to do with this these models in this video. So if you view this as anything, maybe view it as inspiration for pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone and kind of trying to take on techniques that you didn't think that you could do or maybe you didn't think that you could do very well because that I think is the best way to grow as a painter but just to grow in any aspect of your life. Try things that make you uncomfortable. Okay, now that that's over, let's get into painting these models. I'm going to start by making some forest style bases. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is grab some plastic bases from various brands that I think will be a good size for all my wolf boys. And then I'm going to trace them out on the cork board that I got from the dollar store. Now I'm going to take stock of the bark I have left over from my previous video and see what pieces would be a good fit for these wolves. Now using my sharp X-Acto knife, I will cut out all of my cork circles. Once they're all cut out, I will coat all of my cork pieces with full strength white glue and place them on a grimy baking tray to dry. While those are drying in front of a fan, I'm going to assemble all of my models. They have some pretty brutal mold lines on their legs and some really big gaps on their shoulders and in their hair. So I'm going to do my best to handle the mold lines with a knife and then fill the gaps with green stuff and a sculpting tool. Sometimes when I'm really focused, I put the model on the table out of frame and then move my fat head into the shot instead. This has revealed to me that I am turning gray. 
This step was really time consuming and I've really never worked on this many models at once before. I think time management is really important when you're working on something like this project because even a small step takes quite a long time when you factor in that you have to do it 14 times and I was really not mentally prepared for that going into this. I think this project has really informed me that I tend to bite off more than I can chew when it comes to crafting projects and normally that's not quite such an issue but I think this one really, really exposed that fact. I tend to have a lot more fun when I just focus on one model at a time with painting. I think the instant gratification of that painting style kind of rewards that dopamine hit in my brain a lot more and it makes the process a lot more fun. Anyway, all of that gap filling has given my cork enough time to harden, so I'm gonna super glue them to all of my plastic bases. Now I'm ready to add some more interest to these bases. I learned in my last video that bark makes killer rocks and cliff faces, so I'm gonna bust that back out and break it into chunks to glue on some of the bigger bases for my wolves. I have these models handy here to make sure that their feet will have good footholds on the bark and that their poses will make sense. For some of the smaller bases, the bark is a little overkill, so I'll just use the offcuts of my cork and break it into rock shapes with my fingers and then glue those onto my bases in the same way. While those bases are drying, I'm gonna take my hand drill and some thin sculpting wire and use it to pin all of my wolves' feet. This is super simple. You just drill a hole in the foot and then glue the wire in using super glue. Then I cut a bunch of XPS foam chunks to stab the wire into and act as handles to hold while painting the models. This worked pretty well, uh, but it did have one major kind of downside and that is that the XPS foam is very light and the models are heavier than it. So they tend to be a little top heavy and I found myself kind of knocking them over by accident a lot while working on this project. Uh, there's a lot of better ways to do this out there like using pill bottles filled with sand or you know professional uh, like handy holds for your, your models. Um, but I didn't have 14 of either of those. So this is kind of like my cheap solution for this. It wasn't super detrimental to knock them over. There wasn't any time where I like knocked them over and paint chip top or anything like that. So maybe I got lucky, but this worked for me. Uh, but if you have other options, maybe try exploring those. The other awesome thing about having the wires pinned in the bases is that these will act as supports when you eventually go to pin the models to the bases. Okay, so once all my bases are dry, I got them wet again. This time I just coated them with watered down white glue to try and seal the bark and cork together and, and also to strengthen them before painting. Then I moved back to my models and brush primed them all with Vallejo Black Primer. After my bases had dried off, I wanted to try and fill in some of the gaps and add a bit more ground texture to them. So I grabbed this modeling paste that I impulse bought on Amazon after I saw DM Scotty use it. I'd never used this product before, so I wasn't exactly sure what to expect. I, I basically just put down a layer of it and sprinkled some small rocks into it while it was still wet. And then I kind of thought it looked a little too smooth. So as any good scientist will tell you, when working on a new experiment, it is best to have as many variables as possible so that when something goes wrong, you have no idea what caused it. So I busted out some baking soda and sprinkled that into all of the modeling paste while it was still wet. My hopes was that this would add kind of a cool dirt texture and maybe make the modeling paste look not quite so smooth. Now it's time to Zenithal highlight my wolves. But first, my extra primer was all dry, so here's some satisfying peeling action. In typical fashion, I'm gonna highlight these wolves from above, starting with dark gray, then light gray, and then finally white. This is mostly to help me see the details while painting them. I don't think too much of this under shading comes through in the final paint job. Now it's time to bust out the brush. I'm gonna start with the fur. I did a little bit of research on what real wolves look like. As you can see here, even gray wolves are mostly black, brown, and cream colored, with their legs and bellies being light and their faces and backs being darker. And black wolves are just kind of black all over. <laughs> so here's my color range of grays and browns to try and replicate that look. I've got Mountain Stone, Tempest Gray, Wolf Gray, very appropriate, Desert Stone, Desert Sand, Skeleton Bone, and Bleached Linen all from the Reaper line. I will take a photo of all the paints used in this build and post it on my Facebook page if you're looking to replicate any of the techniques here for yourself. Link will be in the description. 
First things first, I'm going to coat all of the skin areas with my darkest gray, Mountain Stone. The plan here is to start dark and work my way up to the light areas. Once they're all coated, I'm going to move up to my Tempest Gray. And the interesting thing about this technique is that you are intentionally trying to leave the brush strokes visible to try and sell that fur texture. So I'm going to be brushing out from the dark areas, leaving them dark, but now layering this lighter fur color on top. I'm not worried if the texture is a little over the top at this point either, because I have plenty of lighter colors that will be layering over top of this coat. At this point, I realized that if I was to continue to batch paint all of these wolves in this method, I was going to lose my mind doing one color at a time. So I poured out all of my gray tones and brown tones onto my wet palette and started doing it more on a wolf by wolf basis. This is just much more of a fun way to paint and I'm okay with the result of kind of having various uh, discrepancies between the fur texture of the wolves because like any real animal, each animal is going to be kind of different from the next. They're not all going to be carbon copies of each other. So I was okay with the result of having kind of varied textures. I chose to make the two leaders from my skirmish box black wolves and some of the other wolves are a little bit more like gray and some are more brown. Uh, the leaders of the uh, knights box, the Gortha, Gotha Lords, they are, uh, I tried to make them look more like gray and aged, like they were kind of elders. So basically I just layer up the fur textures lighter and lighter on top of each other in the range that you see on the palette, focusing the lighter areas on the areas of the wolf that are lighter in photos. So the arms, uh, the paws, the bellies, and kind of the underside of the face. And then leaving the darker areas as kind of the back and the, uh, the top of the head. This was actually a pretty fun and liberating painting experience. I think a lot of the time as mini painters, we kind of fret and fuss about getting more uh, perfect transitions between colors and making sure that our blending is smooth and that you can't see any brush strokes. To be working on a bunch of models where large sections of them I'm intentionally leaving a bunch of brush strokes felt very good. It felt kind of freeing and, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. For the black wolves, I just used the exact same technique, except I didn't go as high in my colors uh, brightness. So I left the creams and the uh, brighter browns off the table and I just focused on the dark colors and let them cover an even larger area of the model. After many evenings of repeating those same techniques, all of my furry boys were textured. So I wanted to add some contrast back into the recesses of the musculature. For this, I mixed together some Agrax Earthshade with some flow improver and a little bit of water because I didn't want to completely overpower all of my hard work on the fur texture. And then I just used this to coat all of the fur. So with all of the fur completed, it was time to move on to the cloaks and loincloths of all of these werewolves. On the box, these guys have kind of a blue gold theme to them. And I find that I tend to paint blue cloaks all the time. I like blue cloaks, they look nice. But for this, I wanted to try and change it up and do something a little bit different. I was thinking, you know, werewolves are kind of earthy in their motif. These guys live out in the forest. Upon my original vision of them being kind of like sophisticated tribe of werewolves, maybe they were like a tribe of wood elves that all caught lycanthropy and just kind of leaned into it. And so that kind of led me to thinking like green gold would be really nice and that's what I decided to go with. So I used a three-tone approach for this, and the colors I used were dragon green, cat's eye green, and dungeon slime. I just put them out on my wet palette, and then I thin coat the whole cloak with dragon green. And then I used the other two colors and wet blended them onto the highlights to make them really pop. This works really nicely because cat's eye green and dungeon slime are both yellow toned greens while dragon green is more of a blue toned green. And what this does is it adds a lot of warm, cool contrast onto this while still maintaining that they're all green. So this creates a really nice effect by making your highlights look warm and your shadows look cool and it really makes them pop even more. So it's not just light dark contrast, it's also warm cool. And having that kind of double hit really makes uh, your pieces pop and for this I was really satisfied with how it worked on all of the cloaks and glowing cloths. Once those were all coated I wanted to reinforce my shadows on the cloaks and for this I just used some Giltan green and painted it onto only the folds and recesses of the cloaks. Once that was dry it was time for their mouths. 
For this, I mixed together some gory red with some monster maw to try and darken it a little bit. I also bought this like magnifying glass headset thing to try and make out the details better when I'm painting small areas of miniatures. It works pretty well, uh, but my art director says that I look like the world's tallest gnome tinkerer when I wear it, so... But she's stuck with me now, boys, so it's okay if I get dorky. Now I'm just gonna base coat all of the leather straps with some mahogany brown. It has a nice red undertone to it, and I figured that it will be a nice subtle way to contrast the green fabrics and make them pop even more. I used some nut brown for the two guys with spears. These were really the only two that had any wood on them, so not a whole ton of coverage involved here. The two black wolves have some areas that look like wraps or bandages, so I base coated those with linen white. And while I have the linen white handy, I also used it to paint out all of the teeth on my wolves. While I was working on their faces, I figured it was time to jump into the eyes. For this, I used marigold yellow to base coat them, and then a golden glow to add some highlights to them. And then to clean up any areas where I may have gotten sloppy painting the eyes, I just took out some of my grays and browns that I had used originally and cleaned up the areas around the eyes. I used some leather brown to bring out any extra leathery details on the model, like straps or pouches. Then I coated all the leather and linen areas with more Agrax Earthshade. Using coal black, I painted out all the thick claws on their feet, and I also used this to line their lips, paint their noses, and line the eyes. Dogs tend to have this kind of black line around their mouth, and I put it on a little bit thick here, but I can fix that later. I think it really helps define their eyes and their mouths and makes them pop out a little bit more. Now it was time to move on to easily the most mind-numbing and most challenging stage of this project, the non-metallic metal. If you think that it takes an absolutely absurd amount of time for an amateur painter to paint 14 models all with heavy amounts of non-metallic metal on them, well, you would be correct, because it did. Starting out wasn't quite so bad. The first step was just base coating all of the metal with coal black. For some reason, I decided to start out with my favorite of the wolves, the two Gotha Lords. They have uh, quite a bit of metal on them, and I wanted to kind of differentiate between it. I didn't want everything to be in the same tones because I feel like that is a easy or easy trap to fall into and it uh, makes it look kind of amateur. So I wanted the bulk of them to be like gray iron metals with a lot of gold highlights, but they have these big collar pieces around their neck and I wanted those to look like a metallic green with probably a gold trim. And so that's kind of the area I started with for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, I think in hindsight, that's probably the most challenging one to pull off out of the iron versus gold versus green metal. But for whatever reason, I started there. I used all of the same colors as the cloaks, but I also added white and black to my palette to kind of pump up the contrast. I don't really feel qualified to instruct you on how to achieve a good result with this part, there are plenty of good videos about doing metallic metal. Miniac has one and so does Squidmar. I watched both of those and they were really valuable, so check those out if you want like a step-by-step -step tutorial. What I will say is pick your viewing angles intentionally. Unlike most regular objects that absorb light, metal reflects it and it reflects it at your eyes. So whatever part will be brightest is the part that is pointing at the viewer. So when you're looking at your models, you have to think about where you want it to be viewed from when painting in non-metallic metal. For this, I chose the front and the back. So my highlights are going to be pointing straight forward and straight back and my dark areas are going to be above and below. The second thing I'll say is that high contrast is your friend. And what I mean by that is you want your brights to be very bright and you want your darks to be very dark. And you generally want them to be kind of close to each other with minimal transitions between the two. That's gonna help sell the look of this being very shiny. The third thing that I noticed while working on all of this non-metallic metal is that it looks like absolute shit for 95% of the time you're working on it. And then somehow it magically turns to looking half decent or even pretty good in that last 5%. And I could never really put my finger on kind of when that happens in the process. It's just right before it's finished, it looks 
bad and then it's finished and it looks good. I was pretty happy with some of the results I achieved, but I definitely found that, that kind of 95, 5% phenomenon popping up every single model I was doing. By the time I decided to settle and call my green collars done here, I wasn't entirely satisfied with the results, but I was deciding to cut my losses and move on to the other pieces because it's such a small area and I didn't want to just spend hours and hours and hours on it. I wanted to kind of move on and I was honestly feeling bad about myself at this point because I wasn't pulling it off to kind of the standard that I wanted to achieve and I felt like moving on to the other elements would give me a little bit more confidence and make me feel like I could actually do it properly because I think that they're easier. Like I said, for the regular metals, I had a lot more confidence because these are just using blacks and grays and white to achieve that look and not so much trying to layer in the colors to, to make it look shiny. Over the course of painting all 14 models in this way, I found this is the technique that worked for me, and what I did is this. I paint the whole surface in a thin coat of dark grey, then using my light grey, I pick out the areas where I want my highlights to be. Then I blend those colours together a little bit, and I add some white to the centre of those highlights and blend that out as well. Next I add black to the areas where there are no highlights and blend that together. Then you just keep, repeat that by adding white to light areas and black to dark areas until you have a believable metal look. Next, if it was a weapon, I would add a line of black along the flat edge of the blade and blend that away from the sharp edge onto the flat area. And lastly, I would use a thin, thin white to edge highlight all of the edges and to also call out any nicks or scratches in the metal. This isn't a professional result by any means, but it's good enough for me and I thought that it looked pretty decent. I think some people have a more subtle way of achieving this look, but my art director likes to say I have a too much gene. I think that's a Jenna Marbles thing. I'm not sure. Speaking of my art director, she actually saw me taking forever and a day to complete these models and I guess she maybe took pity on me and decided to jump down at the table and help me by painting a couple swords and spears, so shout out to her, that was great. I think if I wasn't painting 14 models at the same time, I would have actually enjoyed this experience quite a bit. I think painting the non-metallic metal made me actually feel like a good painter. It's such kind of a hyped up technique and everybody kind of universally agrees that it's challenging. So achieving it, at least, you know, in a somewhat decent way, made me feel pretty good about myself. So I think I'll definitely be going back to it and using it more in the future and I'm looking forward to it. One small thing that I did on only the black wolves, they have this flat area on their arm blades and to shake things up I wanted to paint it to look a little bit rusty. So I base coated it with brown and then I just stippled on a couple different oranges to try and give it that rusted look. There are a few details on some of the models that I wanted the color to be more of a gold bronze metal look. And for this, it's the exact same technique. But instead of grays, I'm using dark browns, browns, oranges, and yellows. Here's what one of my wolves looks like with a decent amount of gold trim and gold pieces done in the non-metallic metal style. On the leader, he has a significant amount of pieces that I wanted to add the gold look to. And at this point, I was really hoping that this would help make him look complete because I felt like there was something missing. I started by basing all of the golds in a muddy brown. Then I added my first highlight, which is rich leather. Once that was covered, I moved on to a burnt orange. This is actually kind of where that gold metallic look starts to materialize. After the burnt orange, I used marigold yellow, and I only put it on the highlight areas. For the trim especially, this is really easy to do. This is because you've already established where your highlights on the main armor pieces are. So with the trim, you just make sure it lines up. This really sells the effect, and I find that it makes both types of the metal look more realistic. I felt like it really saved the green on the collar at this stage. After the marigold yellow, I used golden glow for my brightest areas of the gold. And here's the finished look. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of both of the lords together. Oddly enough, I actually liked the first one I did better as far as the gold is concerned. I don't know what to make of that exactly. I think I overdid the highlights on the second one a little bit. 
After finishing all of the non-metallic metal pieces, finally, I was excited to get back to working on some of the smaller details of the models. So I busted out my desert stone, and I used that to clean up my black lines around the eyes and mouths, and make them a little less thick. Then I mixed together another batch of watered down earth shade, and I used that to coat all of my gold metal pieces in an attempt to try and tone it down a little bit. I feel like the golden glow got a little bit out of hand in some areas. So here's how you know I might be a little bit of a masochist, because I decided at this point that I wanted to try and go back to my non-metallic metal and bump it up a little bit, make it a little bit more advanced, a little bit more realistic. A lot of the time when people are working on non-metallic metal, because metal is reflective, they will paint in the colors of the things around the metal, and that makes it look real, because real metal does that. So for these wolves, I decided to try and replicate that technique with a glaze. And for the two colors that I decided to use were blue and green. This is because I imagine them kind of in a forest and the blue tones will be coming from above due to the sky and the green tones will be coming from below, from the grass below them or the bushes or whatever is near them. My hope for this is that it'll give the metal a bit more of a nuanced look and it'll also uh, tone down a little bit of my bright white highlights. I think a lot of the time people doing non-metallic metal don't actually use white because it gets a little bit intense. They use kind of an off-white. Uh, so I'm hoping that my glazes kind of do those two things. So my goal for this was to have it be really subtle because I know I have the tendency to overdo things and I really didn't want to mess up all my hard work working on the non-metallic metal. I decided to start with the blue. For this, I used sapphire blue and I watered it down almost to the consistency of like dirty paint water. Tested it on one of my smaller models. I would just paint it onto the areas that were facing up of all of the iron toned metals. And then using Q-tips, I would kind of wipe off anywhere where it pooled or I put too much paint. I found that even with wiping it away, my first batch of blue was a little bit more opaque than I'd like, and I wanted the effect to be more subtle than that. So in this instance, I conquered my too much gene, and I made a second batch of blue that was significantly thinner. This second batch worked really well. It gave my metal more of a nuanced blue look, and it toned down my white highlights a bit. I was really, really satisfied with how this one turned out. Okay, now to replicate that exact process for the downward facing metal areas using green. For this, I used cat's eye green and I watered it down in the exact same way. I was really worried before doing these two steps, but I think that they really elevate the look of all of my metal pieces. I'm really happy with how they turned out and I will definitely be keeping this technique in my back pocket for future projects. After some finishing touches on the wolves, I had found that their teeth got a little bit washed away in the process, so I just popped them back out with a dry brush. I also dry brush highlighted some of the hair areas on their backs, tails, and heads with desert sand. I also mixed together a light wash with flesh shade and flow improver. I painted that around their mouths where their fur would be thinner and you could see a little bit more of those flesh tones coming through. This also doubles as covering any areas where I might have gotten sloppy while dry brushing the teeth. Now that the wolves are totally finished, it's finally time to get back to those bases that we started at the beginning. I started by wiping off any excess baking soda from way back when I applied it before. It seemed to work okay and didn't interfere with the modeling paste too much. One thing that did happen in some areas where the paste was thicker was that it had a couple of deep cracks that opened up and you could see the cork all the way through them. I was totally okay with this. It added some extra detail. However, I'm unsure if the paste works that way all the time or if this is just a result of the baking soda having some kind of reaction with it. Now I'm gonna level with you guys. At this point it had been about two months since I had last worked on these bases and I had completely forgotten the step that I had done before where I coated all of the bark and cork with watered down white glue to seal it. So for base coating these, I used the Black Magic Base Coat, a uh, link to Jeremy's video about it in the top right. It's essentially just uh, Mod Podge and black paint. and. This is a great base coat for all my terrain and I use it for almost everything, um, but I don't usually use it 
for anything to do with minis because it does kind of clog up details a little bit no matter how careful you are with it. I think the superior way to prime these would be using Vallejo primer, um, but in my head I hadn't sealed them yet and the Mod Podge was to seal them. So that's what I used for this step. So anyway, here's what they all look like dry. One thing that happened here that was a little weird, among some of the higher edges, you can see some white poking through the base coat. This actually happened further on in the project anytime I used something that was very watery on the bases, like a wash. I think this may be the modeling paste reactivating, but I'm not entirely sure. It could be white glue also reactivating, but that doesn't normally happen when I do my bases like this. So I'm not super sure what to nail it down on. It wasn't a huge issue, but it did require me to repaint some areas after I washed them. So at this point, I'm reaching page 14 in my script, and I'm starting to think that this video is probably leaning on the longer side. So I'm gonna make the executive decision to cut the base painting a little short. If you're interested in a step-by-step -step guide on exactly how to achieve this look and color scheme, you can check out my Hills and Cliffs video from before. It's my, my second most recent video to this one, and that will go into a step-by-step -step guide of how exactly I achieve this. I'm using pretty much the same method. But to sum it up, if you're not interested in checking out a second video, the gist of it is this. I paint all the dirt in brown, and then I use my classic stone recipe for all of the rocks. I cover any grass areas with light and dark flock, followed by some dark green clump foliage, and then I super glue grass tufts onto any denser foliage areas. One detail I will go into is how I attach the werewolves to their bases. For this, I just clipped their pins off at a decent length from the handholds. I straightened them out, and then I roughly lined them up on the bases where they would fit nicely. I used my hand drill with the same bit as before to drill holes in the bases for the pins. I coat the pins and the holes both in super glue, and then I pushed the models into place to dry. After they were in place, I added some extra foliage where appropriate, as well as some red flowers to the larger bases for an extra pop of contrasting color. Then I just paint the rims with a black craft paint and bam, they're finished. Here's what they all look like. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that you guys can find something inspiring from this video that you can apply to your own projects. I know that people don't usually respond as well to my painting videos as you do to my crafting ones, but I felt like painting, and I also didn't quite expect it to take me quite so long to finish it. However, I do already have an idea for my next build, and it's definitely going to be a craft, so stay tuned for that one. It's not gonna take me two months this time. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching and supporting my channel. It really means a lot to me to read all your nice comments. If you enjoyed this video, I have plenty of other crafting and painting videos that you could check out in the meantime. I will see you guys in my next video. Have a great week. Someone's vacuuming outside.